The start of the question looks very similar to all the other past papers. You've got October, November here. 2019, you've got the marker location, 70 marks. Um, you've got details there regarding the examiners. Obviously, the course code, financial management. Then they've given you a breakdown. You've got four questions here. The first question, capital budgeting, cash flows and cost of capital. That's 25 marks. You've got risk and refinement and capital budgeting leverage and capital structure and then dividend policy another long question there 21 marks and 25 so those are the two longer questions remember exam technique is very important i'd be looking at starting maybe with the easier or the shorter questions depending on which sections you prefer completing it's always based on your capability so just follow the correct exam technique and you should be able to do quite well here the totals out of 70 Let's start. I'm just going to start with the first question and continue from start to finish. But again, apply good exam technique to get the most possible marks from your attempt in the actual assessment. Remember, you need to be passing each question in order to do well. Question one. Remember, the first thing I would suggest you do is read the question and highlight anything that stands out because you're looking for key points or um, sections in the actual question that can give you some indication of what you're going to be required to do. Question one, you've got Anglo Cold Nell, a uh, Vitbank Cold Mining Company is considering replacing. That's important. This is obviously a replacement decision. So we're not looking at expansion, we're looking at replacement. When we look at a, a replacement, the new and the old are both important. That's something to consider based on theory from the notes. It's fleet of trucks with conveyor belts to move coal to a preparation plant after they have been removed from the mine. We've got a fleet of trucks. The trucks were bought five years ago for two million. That was obviously in the past. So that's the old asset. Anglo Cold now uses a diminishing balance method to depreciate its fixed asset. That's also important because now United diminished the asset's value. Okay, it's carrying it's obviously based on carrying value because it's his diminishing balance. The fleet of trucks can be sold for four hundred thousand and has a zero book value. Right, so if it has a zero book value, there's obviously no residual value. Um the fleet of trucks can be sold, meaning they can be um disposed of at today's point for 400,000. Right, then you've got the new asset, which is the conveyor belts. They'll be depreciated to a book value of zero over five years. That's also important because that gives you scope in terms of time for this new particular asset. This is obviously a replacement decision. Um, useful life using a straight line method. Okay, so that's obviously easier to calculate. And the conveyor belts cost 2.5 million. Okay, just remember, Unisa doesn't put a comma here. It's not 25 million, it's, it's, it's 2.5 million. Financing of the conveyor belts. The firm can raise long term debt by selling 10 year 9% coupon bonds, each with a par value of 1,000. Okay, so that's financing method number one. Because similar risk bonds earn returns greater than 8%, the firm must sell the bonds for 930 the flotation cost is four percent and the par value nine percent pref shares of a hundred can be issued at a flotation cost of five rand okay so that's just describing um, the background in terms of what these actual um, bonds can be sold for in the market when raising capital the firm's ordinary shares are currently selling for uh, 50 rand again there should be a comma here and it expects to pay a 4 rand 40 dividend at the end of the current year. Okay, so now we've got ordinary shares as well. Form of financing number two. Then they say the company's capital structure used in calculating its weighted average cost of capital is as follows 60% ordinary shares, 10% pref shares, 30% long term debt. Okay, so obviously there are um, three forms of financing. I didn't highlight this one. I just highlighted the pref uh, the ordinary shares. Um, I'm going to highlight this one as well, okay? Because now we've got the splits: sixty ordinary, ten preference, thirty long term debt. So we've got one, two, three forms of financing in total. All right? Obviously, having read this, remember I'm just looking at scope, 
I'm trying to understand what the question is asking me to do. The dividends for the past six years are shown below. Okay, the, the reason why they give you dividends is because of a growth rate. That's what you should be thinking about when you look at this question. In addition to the information provided in the case study, the finance director ascertains the following. The company expects the replacement of tracks to, to increase EBIT by 800,000 annually. Okay, that's obviously going to be used for OCF because this is looking at a expansion, uh, not an expansion, uh, a replacement decision. If it was expansion, then it would just be zero for the old asset. Here we look at the new and the old. Income capital gains, tax the 28%. Okay, that's obviously applicable when working out after tax costs. And then you've got a note here, Anglo uh, Cole now has provided you, a consultant, a fee of 20,000 to advise them on whether the replacement of tr uh, trucks uh, whether to replace the trucks or not. Okay, so when they give you things like this, it's just worthwhile considering theory. But remember, this would be considered a sunk cost. So obviously, if there are theory questions in the actual uh, required part of the question, you would want to cover this somewhere in your discussion. Because as I said in some of our weekly lessons, is that you don't know where UNIS is going to be giving you marks. So all of these things need to be addressed somewhere in your answer, depending on what they're asking you to calculate. Okay, then you've got required. 1.1, explain without any calculation. So this is all theory. In the space provided below, the process, brackets, capital budgeting slash determination of relevant cash flow that you will follow to make your recommendation to the management of Anglo Cold Now. Okay, this is for five marks, right? So look at the mark allocation. Because this is for five marks, you should be, um, no, well, let's say identifying that if it's a five mark question, I need to provide five points minimum. If you can provide more, please provide more. It's always better to write more if you can. Um, it's, the space is a bit limited, but you need to try your best to fit it in. Um, I think there is rough paper as well provided later on um, towards the end of the um, exam script, and you can obviously make use of that. But five points is key when we'll looking at question number one. Right, this is obviously explaining without calculations, and they want to know what the process is for capital budgeting okay, and determining relevant cash flow. Right, capital budgeting. Right, we need points on that and also relevant cash flow. Those are the two concepts that, that the textbook is basically describing. Right, so you can actually go back to our notes and you can have a look at some of the content contained here because we were looking at the capital budgeting. Right, this is obviously the focus for this particular question, capital budgeting and cash flow principles. Um, there's a lot here that you could probably pull out um, in terms of the process. Uh, remember, we're looking at making a decision. Okay, new and old is key, so I'll definitely be addressing that. Capital budgeting process, there you go. The proposal generation, the review, the analysis, the decision making, implementation, and follow up. I would be discussing this as part of your answer because the question specifically say, uh, said the process, brackets, capital budgeting, slash, determination of relevant cash flow. This is what I would be looking at as part of the answer. So I'm going to take this information and I'm going to copy it and I'm going to paste it in our solution. All right, please make sure that you are addressing this in your specific answer because they asked you to look at the capital budgeting process. This is the capital budgeting process. Uh, maybe just to move this down. Now we need to look at the relevant cash flow. Right, remember, all of these things came from the textbook, right? the notes in the actual textbook. This is just a summary. So we would also be looking at this, independent projects versus, versus mutually exclusive projects. Obviously, this is going to be considered which? Mutually exclusive or independent? Well, if you understand what the theory says, does the one eliminate the other? Well, yes, if you're going to be replacing these trucks with conveyor belts, you're not going to be using both to transport coal. Coal is either going to go to the 
um, power station with trucks or the coal is going to be go uh, going to the power station with conveyor belts. So is the one going to eliminate the other? Yes. So they're mutually exclusive projects. That's something that I would also discuss as part of the discussion regarding the cash flow. Mutually exclusive projects. Just explain what you've got there in the notes. Okay, when looking at the capital budgeting process, we know there's obviously a whole bunch of steps that we need to do practically in order to get to where we need to go. These are some of the other things that I would mention in terms of rationing. How much capital does the actual company have when looking at approving a particular project? The accept reject criteria is important when looking at NPV, IR, and so on. That's something else that you could mention here. And the ranking approach, okay, obviously the best to the least um, important in terms of what's going to create value. This isn't so important for this question. Why? Because you're not looking at multiple projects. You're looking at one replacement of trucks with conveyor belts. So this one, if you didn't recall when you were in your exam, you, you don't have to include that. If you want to, you can discuss it. But because you're limited in terms of space and time, maybe you can leave it up. But again, I'm just adding everything that you could possibly discuss to give you the most comprehensive answer possible. The last thing that I would maybe look at discussing is this, the conventional versus the non-conventional cash flow. Just as an additional discussion regarding this, what is relevant and what is irrelevant. When I discuss relevant and irrelevant, I would definitely be discussing a sunk cost because that was given in the actual question. Sunk costs we spoke about when we looked at theory. Here's it, sunk costs. This is something that I would definitely be discussing as part of what's relevant and what's irrelevant. You have to include that. But if you want to, you can discuss all the other costs, for example, the opportunity costs as well, but I don't think it's that relevant in this particular question. Something else to consider, relevant cash flows, you're looking at new minus old, new minus old, new minus old. Right, remember, these are relevant cash flows. So based on theory, this is something that I would want to include as part of my answer. Right, again, this is my answer, my suggested solution to you when approaching this particular question. Right, remember, it's a five mark question, so you're obviously not going to be discussing everything in detail, but these are some of the more important things that you should be focusing on. There is a lot more that you could probably discuss looking at the textbook theory and the notes and even the UNISA study guide, but again, you need to decide what is more important. Okay, based on the question here, I've already highlighted the things that are important. Make sure you cover the process, that's key. And make sure you cover relevant cash flow, that's also key. They said at the beginning, there's no calculations here, so don't do any calculations if you're not required to. For five marks, try to generate five points minimum. I would suggest creating more points just to make sure that you do get the maximum marks awarded. Next question, 1.2. Question 1.2 is now dealing with calculations. If we go to the question, the question says, state whether or not according to the net present value decision criteria. That's all we're going to be looking at. So we're not going to be focusing on IRR or payback period or anything like that. The only thing I'm going to be looking at is NPV. Why? Because that's what they asked me to do. And this is looking at the trucks and whether they should be replaced or not. They said, show all calculations. This is a large question. 20 marks. So remember, when looking at NPV, just based on theory, going back to your notes, we're going to be drawing up a timeline, very similar to the one we did in our picture here, painting the big picture. These are from our notes. Obviously, I'm going to be looking at three things. The first thing that I'm going to be focusing on is the initial investment. Okay, that's something that you need to calculate. Then you're going to be looking at these things, the OCFs, for each and every year. And we know this is a five year project. And then at the end of this project, you're going to be looking at the TCF, the terminal cash flow. Right, that's what you're going to be doing when you're going to be completing this particular question. 
Right, so in order to do that, we need to go get our templates. Okay, and this you would have studied heading into your exam. Okay, every single calculation has a specific template. All right, so let's get to our first template. OCF, where's T yeah, initial investment? There we go. Okay, there's our first template. Okay, we did examples when we looked at this. Now we need to do the answer. Okay, so according to the NPV calculation, we're obviously going to be a following, following a process. Step one or stage one, get the INV. Okay, what do I mean by INV? Initial investments. Okay, there's the initial investment, right? The initial investment is calculated based on the textbook structure, the layout, the formats. That will never, ever change. So all I need to do is get that from the notes that I've studied, and I need to put that in my workings. Paste. Okay, there we go. Right, there's the structure, there's the layout, there's the format. Okay, so now I need to go to the question and I need to pull out all the information that's relevant for this particular calculation. Notice, I'm not doing all three things in one go. I'm doing step by step. Okay, because I've learned and I've studied the notes and the theory from the textbook and I know that this, for the first step is to calculate the initial investment. Right, to calculate the initial investment, I need the install cost of the new, and I need the after-tax process of the old, and I need to add or subtract any change in working capital. Right, so what do I do? I go to the question. There wasn't, yeah, they didn't split it. You can see here, this is just one question, lots of lines for you to answer. Go back to the question, get what you need. Okay, first part is just background. Second part is the old and then the new. Okay, so obviously the old is important when I look at that for replacement decisions. I'm going to first start with the new because that's what I'm going to need in order to do this calculation. Installed cost of the machine. Okay, cost of the machine, 2.5 million. We can clearly see there are no installation costs. So I'm going to put a zero for installation costs. And it was 2.5 million. So the install cost of the new machine would obviously be the 2.5 with zero installation costs. Right, notice this is my structure for my answer. This is how I'm going to lay it out for the actual examiner so they can mark this correctly because I followed the correct structure. Then I'm going to less after tax proceeds from the sale of the old. What proceeds do I get from the old? Go to the question, look for it. We read it when we read this earlier. 400,000 was the after-tax proceeds from the, uh, well, the proceeds, I should say, um, and then I need to minus the after-tax. Okay, we can clearly see there's zero book value. In other words, no carrying value. So there's no carrying value. That means this full amount will be subject to tax. So proceeds, 400,000. Less tax on the sale. If I show a working for this, it's obviously... 400,000 minus zero, because there's no carrying value, equals 400,000. Then I multiply this by the tax rate, which was 28% in the question. Let's go and look at that just to confirm it. Yes, tax rate and, well, income and capital gains, 28%. So, 28% of this, 112. Less after-tax proceeds for the sale of the old asset, this minus that gives me 228. Okay, did they talk about any change in working capital? We can go back and we can read through this again if you, if you want to. If you recall from what I read earlier, I didn't see any change in working capital. So this would be a zero. Then I need to work out the initial investment. Okay, so the install cost of the new, 2.5 million, less the after-tax proceeds of the old. There's the initial investment. Right, there's my first little bit of information that I need in order to do this. Okay, how much was it? 2212. Okay, that's the initial investment. 
That's where it goes. Right, now what do I do? Stage two, or step two. Calculate OCF. Right, so what am I going to do to calculate OCF? Again, I need information. Right, from our notes, we know that the approach is going to follow this. Okay, revenue, less expenses, blah, blah, blah. Okay, depending on what information they give you in the question. If you look at the question, all they've given you in the question here is EBIT. They said that the EBIT is going to increase by 800,000 annually. That's what they said. Okay, if I go back to the question, okay, question one, right, there's no mention here about what the EBIT was before the change. Okay, but remember, this EBIT is a relevant cost because it has changed. So it is going to be included. We don't know what the change was before because they didn't tell us the before and after figures. Okay, we can't calculate the before or after. The before wasn't given. The after we could calculate because they said it was an increase in EBIT of 800,000 annually. Okay, it's 800,000 annually. So we're going to assume that this is a plus 800,000 that's going to come in every year. Do I have the old asset? No, I don't. See, nothing about the old asset, nothing about the new asset. All you've got here is the financing. Okay, so let's get our templates. Here, EBIT, less taxes, net operating profit, add back depreciation. Okay. Take this. Copy that. Just this part, actually. Okay. And let's record that in there. There we go. Okay, obviously, I'm going to be looking at three years. Year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. Why am I looking at five years? It's because the new asset is going to have a five-year useful life. Right, EBIT we know is going to increase by plus 800,000. Right, they didn't give us any other figures to work with, so I can only use the 800,000 here. Right, less taxes. Taxes were 28% times 28%. There's the taxes. Okay, net operating profit will be the difference. This minus that. Okay, then I'm going to have to add back any depreciation that I would have taken off. Remember, we're looking at the asset. Where's the asset? Here. Uh, the fleet of trucks. Okay, diminishing balance method. And the, it was 2 million. Okay, that was the fleet of truck. That was the old asset. Okay, so the, 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 truck, the trucks were bought five years ago. Okay, so if they were bought five years ago, would I have any depreciation now? No, because there's no book value. So there isn't going to be any old depreciation. All I'm going to be looking at is the new depreciation because this is going to be used for five years. Okay, remember, these are five-year-old assets in terms of the truck. So there's no book value, meaning they don't have any useful life. Okay, they've reached the end of their useful life. The conveyor belts, though, have five years. And this is looking at straight line. And the conveyor belts cost 2.5 million. Right, so what is the depreciation? Well, 2.5 million straight line over five years. 2.5 million straight line. So I can just divide by five. 500,000 a year. And that's what I'm going to show there. I'm going to add back the depreciation. So operating cash flow, what would that be? Let's work it out. This plus the depreciation. There we go. Those are the operating costs. Operating cash flows. Okay, well, the costs, basically, um, in terms of the capital budgeting. Right, what else do we have here? Okay, the financing, that's obviously getting the rate that we'll need. Um, the TCF, that's the last bit. Go to our notes, get the template for TCF. Here, terminal cash flow. Take this, copy that. 
this will be stage three, TCF calculation. It's just a template, you've been using it in all the past papers that we've been doing, you're going to be using the same thing here. when working out the terminal cash flow. Right, stage three terminal cash flow, let's do the calculation. After tax proceeds from the sale of the new asset. Okay, proceeds from the new asset. Let's go look at the information. Okay, conveyor belts, cost 2.5. We don't know what the TCF is. Okay, for the new asset at the end of its useful life. Right, we don't have that particular bit of information. Okay, so we cannot include the TCF for that. So after tax process from the sale of the new asset, I'm going to say unknown. Okay, it's not given. Proceeds from the new, unknown. Not given. Right, I'm showing the examiner that I know I have to do a TCF calculation. If no information is provided, I can't do it. Less taxes of the uh, of the asset also unknown not given okay less after tax proceeds from the sale of the old well this is now going to relate to the old trucks that are now going to be a further five years old okay because they were at zero book value okay that was here okay when we we're deciding to start this project but now at the end of this project five years later on what is the TCF going to be for those trucks at the end? Okay, we're probably going to assume nothing, zero. Okay, because you cannot use this 400,000 because this 400,000 is what it's going to be sold for now when they replace the trucks, not at the end of this new project when the conveyor belts have now been used. Okay, so the, the TCF here would be zero. Okay, you would ignore it as well. Okay, I know not given. No working capital, nothing there, no terminal cash flow. Okay, so I'm just showing you that there wouldn't have been a calculation. Right, had they given you enough information, you would have to complete this exercise. But it's zero because the information wasn't provided in the question. Right, so that helps us quite a bit because now we've only got initial investment and operating cash flow. That's all we've got when doing the NPV calculation. Right, in order to do the NPV calculation, before doing the NPV, we need a rate, a discount rate. Right, so where does the discount rate come from? The discount rate comes from your WAC calculation, your weighted average cost of calc. Uh, uh, cost of capital. Okay, that's WAC. That's what WAC stands for. Okay, that you know. Okay, weighted average cost of capital. All right, so I need to do a WAC calculation. Equals. Okay, I know I have three different forms of financing. So weighting times cost, obviously, of debt plus weighting times cost of pref shares plus weighting times cost of the ordinary shares. Okay, so we had debt here, we had pref shares. I'm just re recalling what we read in the question and ordinary shares. Okay, that's why it's so important to scope the question. I scoped the question, so I know what the question had because I read it. Okay, so I'm just going back and I'm thinking, well, debt, pref shares and ordinary shares. Okay, copy, paste. Right, in the question, there, the financing, okay? We already know there's 60% ordinary shares, 10% preference shares, 30% long-term debt. Okay, so 30% long-term debt. What else did they say? 10% pref shares, 60% ordinary. Okay, 
And there we go. Cost of equity, cost of debt. We've got it. Right. 30%, 10%, 60%. All I need now is cost of debt, cost of pref shares, and cost of ordinary shares. So let's start with cost of debt. Cost of debt calculation. Let's work it out. This is a simple time value of money that you did in FIN 2601. Let's go look at the question and let's get that amount. Okay, the firm can raise long-term debt by selling 10-year 9% coupon bonds, each with a par value of 1,000. Right, that's important. Because similar risk bonds earn returns greater than 8%, the firm must sell the bonds for 930. There's your present value. PV 930. Future value, par value, 1,000. PMT is the coupons. Uh, these were 9% coupon bonds. 9% of the coupon, uh, well, of the par, I should say, which is the coupon. 9% times 1,000 is 90. How many years? 10-year bonds. Okay, what else do we have in the question? Um, the firm must sell the ones for there. Okay, then they say, uh, the flotation cost is 4% of par, 9% pref shares of 100 par can be issued at flotation cost of 5. Okay, so this flotation cost is 4%. 4% uh, is this for the bonds or is this for the pref share? Let's read it again nicely. Because similar risk bonds earn returns greater than 8%. The firm I sell the bonds for. Okay, you're selling the bonds for that. The flotation cost is 4% of the par value. I would say that's the end and I would say that's for the bonds. Okay, so flotation cost 4%. So now we need to subtract here. Okay, less 4% of 930. Okay, which gives us, let's see, 930 minus brackets 4% of 930 gives us that answer. Let's add more decimals just in case. Okay, it's 80 cents, that's fine. Right, solve for I, okay, which is the rate. Okay, the rate. N was 10 years. The payment was 90. The present value was negative 982.80. The future value is par 1000. Okay, the rate is, again, put more decimals. I would use two or three decimals here just to be accurate. I'll leave it as two decimals, 10.81%. All right, but remember, this is cost of debt. Remember, when looking at WAC, you need the after-tax cost of debt. That's before tax. Okay, so less tax at... 28%, so 10.81% minus 28% of 10.81% equals, I'm basically going to say this times 0.71, uh, 72, okay, oh, times 100, make it a percentage. Right, and then round that off. Percent. Right, so it's there. It's 7.78%. Uh, you can check it. You can say 10.81 minus brackets 10.81 uh, times 28%, close brackets equals. Same answer. Okay, if you round it off, you're going to get that. All right, perfect. So I've got that after tax cost of debt. Now we need the cost of pref shares. All 
Right, what is the cost of PREF shares? I need to go read. 9% PREF shares of 100 par value can be issued at a flotation cost of 5. Okay, remember PREF shares are perpetuities, okay, in terms of never-ending payments. So when working out the rates, uh, you can use the PV equals the div 1 over the R, okay, if you want to, and then you can just rearrange. R would then equal div 1 divided by PV. Okay, so let's work it out. R equals, what is the dividend? The dividend is 9% of 100. 9% of 100. Divided by, okay, the PV is obviously the price after flotation cost. So what's it? 100 Rand par value minus 5. So it's 95. 100 Rand minus 5. Close brackets equals. Okay, let's work that out. Type that into your calculator. And you get that as a percentage. Again, okay, round it off to two decimals, just to be accurate. Okay, and the last one is the equity. Um, here's it. Okay, ordinary shares are currently selling for 50 Rand. It's expected to pay a 4 and 40 dividend at the end of the current year. End of the current year, that's div 1, so that's fine. The company's capital structure, okay, that's fine. We don't need that. We just need the first part. Okay, we also need the growth, though. All right, so another cost, the last one. Okay, remember there's three components. We've got the first, we've got the second, we need the third. Okay, the ordinary shares. Right, again, there's a formula here. Okay, in terms of um, the textbook, you can just write in what you've studied or you can use Gordon Growth and then just rearrange. I'm just going to write down what the textbook gave us plus growth. Okay, that's what the formula looks like. All right, what is the dividend? 4 Rand 40. The firm's ordinary shares are selling for 50 Rand. Okay, so 4 Rand 40. 50 Rand plus G, which is the growth. Okay, I need the G. Okay, calculation for growth. Right, where do I get that information from? The table. Okay, this is year one, year six. Right, so that's the dividend. Okay, the dividend in year one is four rand. In year two, okay, so here the dividends are actually decreasing. The dividends for, oh, it says here, the dividends for the past six years are shown below. Okay, so the past six years, meaning obviously the the the, the six the last six year which was that figure so that'll be t0 and that'll be t5 okay one two three four five years okay over the last five years All right so that would be two rand fifty to four rand okay so pv two rand fifty future value four rand n5 sol for r Okay, the rate, the I. Okay, so the rate, the N was 5. The payment, non-existent here. Present value, negative 2 and 50. FE, 4. Okay, there's the I. The I is 10%. Again, let's just round it off just to make sure. Okay, it's actually less, 9.86 with less rounding. Okay, so I'm going to use two decimals for all of these things. Right, so is it possible to work out WAC? Yes, it is. I'm going to copy that formula from above. And I'm going to insert my answers. Cost of debt, what is it after tax? 7.78. Cost of PREF shares, what is it after tax? Well, it is after tax because this is a dividend, 0.47. And the cost of the ordinary shares was 9.86. There we go. Okay. Grab the calculator. Do a WAC calculation. And 
and I get that as an answer. Right, let's highlight it. Let's round it off. Nearest two decimal places. Nine point two percent K is the weighted average cost of capital. All right, so now that you have everything, you've got the cash flow and you've got the WAC. All right, so if I had to draw the diagram, okay, obviously the OCS we we know it's from the working that we had here. Where is it? There. Okay, one o seven six. Okay, initial investment negative. Then these are all positive. Okay, these are OCFs. No TCF. Now we've got a system of cash flows that we can use. Okay, so last thing, last working. This is for NPV. Okay, year zero, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. Okay, first year, initial investment. Where's our initial investment? There. Okay, OCFs. Uh, where's your OCFs? There. Okay, and obviously the OCFs are the same. Year on year on year on year. Five years. Right, no TCF. And then using a rate, which is the WAC basically, of, what is it, 9.2. Solve for NPV. Right, and this you do on your financial calculator. Okay, I just need to get my financial calculator and then I can do the working. Okay, I've got the calculator. I'm going to type all of those figures in. I'm going to go to the cash flow function. I'm going to put in my rate, 9.2%. I'm going to go into my cash flow. I'm going to insert the values. First cash flow minus two two one two. Next one, one o oh, seven six. One o oh, seven six. One two three zeros. One o oh, seven six. One two three zeros. One o oh, seven six. One two three zeros. One o oh, seven six. One two three zeros. Okay, check. I've got all the cash flows. One two three four five. And the initial investment, perfect. Okay, then I'm going to solve. Solve for NPV, and NPV comes out to one nine five one six three five point eight five eight. That's the net present value. Right, so let's answer the question. Sh uh, state whether or not okay so basically should uh should the trucks be replaced with on conveyor belts definitely all right based on our npv okay state why right so we're going to state why the trucks must be replaced with the conveyor belts because the net present value of the replacement is positive. There is value being created if the trucks are replaced. Okay, so they'll definitely replace the trucks. Right, it, it would make sense. Obviously, we know it will be more cost effective if you just think about it practically. Right, if you're using conveyor belts to transfer coal, it's going to be a lot more inexpensive okay, in terms of using trucks to transport the coal. Okay, and probably more reliable as well. Right, uh, that's something to consider in terms of practical application. Right, that's 20 marks. Question 2. Okay, this is a short question. It's only out of eight. Max Limited is able to invest in either project A or B with the following cash flows. Okay, you can see that these projects have different useful lives. 
and Max is planning to replace either project indefinitely into the future. Okay, so replace either project. Okay, uh, it's a replacement decision, so you can only accept one. Again, I would mention that in terms of theory. Relevant cost of capital, 14%. 2.1. Calculate each project's NPV and the equivalent annual annuity. Okay, that's the annualized NPV. Just given in a different way. And state which of the two projects um, Max pro sorry, which of the two Max Limited should select. Justify your answer. Okay, so all we need to do, put this in your calculator. Project A, project B. Right, so I'm going to take that. Project A. 18,000. 6,600. Six For how many years? One, two, three, four years. One, two, three, four years. Okay, project B. 18,000, 5,000 for how many years? Six. 18,000, 5,000 for six years. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two, four, six, five thousand. Let's check. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Got everything. Perfect. Okay, what rate do I use? 14%. Using 14%, solve for NPV. Okay, for both, obviously. Okay, project, uh, or let's just say NPV for A, NPV for B, and let's work them out. Okay, this is where you grab your calculator. Go to the cash flow function, insert all the cash flows with the rate of 14%. Okay, the first cash flow, negative 18,000. Next cash flow, 6666123. Four of them. Calculate NPV. I get 1230.50121. That's what I get on my calculator. Then you do the same thing for B. Eighteen thousand, five thousand, five thousand. It's two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, five thousands. And then the eighteen thousand. Okay, solve for NPV. One four four three point three three seven five eight three. Okay, those are my NPVs. Right, so there you go. You've answered the first part. Second bit, annualized NPV, or as they called it in this question, the EAA, the equivalent annual annuity. Right, so annualized NPV or equivalent. Annual, what did they say it was? Annuity. Okay, it doesn't really matter what you call it, it's the same thing. Um, PV here will obviously be the NPV. PV equals NPV, which equals for this one, 123 0 0.50121. Okay, and then for this one, PV here equals the NPV, which was 1443.33753. Okay, the number of years in here, four years. In here, six years. Okay, you've got one, yeah, one to four, one to six, great. Right, obviously the rate, I equals 14%. Okay, 14%, perfect. Solve for PMT. 
Okay, let's do that calculation. Right, in here was four. I was 14. For this one, I get 422.31301. Okay, for this one, this is a six year project. Here I get 371.1650782. And that's what I get. Okay, so those are my two answers. Now I need to decide which is better. The question said, calculate each project NPV, we've done it. Calculate that, we've done that. And state which of the two max limited should select. Justify your answer. Okay, obviously this is 8%. Right, so let's justify our answer. Based on the NPV and the EAAs, comma, both projects provide value because the NPVs are NPVs and EAAs are positive. Okay. Project B generates the highest NPV over the six years, but it needs the extra two years compared to project A. When we use the annualized NPV or the EAA as they call it in the question, project A is a better project because more value is created over a shorter period of time. All right, so obviously if you had to make a decision, NPV, both are positive, you can't go wrong with these projects. B does the best, okay, but it requires six years, it requires more time. A does better every year compared to B. And that's what you'd be discussing in this question. And that's 2.1, eight marks. Was that it? Yes. Okay, question three. That was a short question. Question three. Question three says, uh, Vekele Security is a company with long-term capitalization consisting solely of 5 million in ordinary shares. Okay, that's important because that's telling you how much they have. Okay, the capitalization. Then they say the, the company wants to raise 2 million for the acquisition of special equipment and has three options. Okay, so there's three separate options for raising these funds. Plan A. So A is selling ordinary shares at 50 rand each. Plan B, selling bonds at 10% at an interest rate, right? Plan C, issuing PREV shares with an 8% dividend. Okay, so there, there are three options. So in other words, I'm gonna raise capital 2 million and it can come from these three options. The present EBIT is 8 million. The income tax is 50%. And 100,000 order shares of equity capital are currently outstanding. Okay, so currently outstanding means what they have already. Okay, so we've got three different plans. Okay, 3.1. Calculate three coordinates for each plan. Okay, so for each plan. So we've got three plans, A, B, and C, and we need three coordinates for each by selecting any three EBIT values. Okay, so any three EBIT values. 
and finding their associated EPS values. Okay, that's all we have to do. Okay, so we need a formula for this, obviously, EPS. Right, go to your notes. Recall what the formula is. These formulas you would have covered in FIN 2601 as well. There's the formula for EPS. Okay, I'm going to need it, obviously. I'm going to be using it throughout my calculation. Right, I'm just highlighting some important bits and pieces of information. Okay, so we're going to calculate three corners for each plan by selecting any three EBIT values and finding the associated EPS values. All right, so let's look at each plan. Plan A, Plan B, Plan C. Okay, we're going to raise 2 million. All right, 2 million. Plan A said, uh, raising these th uh, funds. Plan A, selling 40,000 ordinary shares. Okay, so that means we're going to obviously have more, right? Because the company, uh, Vukele, is a company with long term capitalization consisting solely of 5 million ordinary shares. Okay, 5 million in ordinary shares. Right, so obviously this is the current. Current equity. 5 million ordinary shares. Um, and they also told us 100,000 ordinary shares of equity are currently outstanding. Okay, 5 million ordinary shares, 5 million rand and ordinary shares of 100,000 shares issued. All right, which gives us a price. So current equity, what's 5 million divided by 100,000? 50 rand per share. Okay, that's the current equity value. Okay, next option, B. Selling bonds at a 10% interest rate. Okay, sell bonds, 10% interest rate. C, issuing PREF shares, 8% dividend. Eight percent dividend. All right, let's do the workings now. Okay, what else do we have? Um, that's all we have. Eight percent dividend. Okay, present EBIT is eight million. Okay, I would always look at the eight million. So current EBIT eight million. Right, that you would definitely have to do, and you'd have to look at that for all three of them. Okay, anything else? Tax is 50%. Okay, we know that. We read that. And then we need to provide three coordinates. Okay, we need to select any three EBIT values for each plan. That's the key. All right, so let's do one plan at a time. Okay, I want three coordinates. So, using three different EBITs. Okay, obviously I'm going to use the current, which is one of them, so 8 million. And then I'm going to choose two others. Okay, choose one more. Choose another. Okay, so I'm going to double it and then reduce it. So I'm going to, make, I'm going to choose 16 million. And then I'm going to halve it, 4 million. Okay, I'm choosing different... EBITs. I'm choosing a smaller one and a bigger one. It doesn't really matter which ones you choose. They, they said choose any, so I'm just choosing them. Okay. All right. So these are the current EBITs. EBIT. Okay. So I'm going to be raising this 2 million and I'm going to be selling these shares. Okay. So obviously I'm going to less interest. Then I'm going to less taxes. EBT, then less taxes. Then I'm going to have after tax, net profit after tax. 
and that's what it obviously wants. Okay, so interest, it'll be zero, zero, zero. Why? Well, you're not issuing any debts. Taxes, they said in the question, was 50%, right? So, what's 50% of all these figures? Let's work it out. Times 50, times 50, times 50. Okay, so the net profit of the tax, this minus that for, both, for all of them. Okay, so there's your net profit after tax. All right, so those are my EBITs. Those are my net profit after tax figures, and that's my formula for, e, uh, for earnings per share. Okay, so I'm going to work out my earnings per share, EPS, EPS. EPS. All right, what is the EPS going to be? Well, profit for the year, that will be the profit for the year. There is no pref div here. Okay, divided by, divided by. Okay, I had um, selling 40,000 ordinary shares. Okay, so if I'm selling 40,000 ordinary shares, I still need to add that to what I have. How many shares that I issued? 100,000. So 100,000 shares plus an additional 40,000 shares. That's what they said I was going to do, right? Plan A, sell 40,000 ordinary shares. Fine. Enter. Gives us that. Same thing for this one. Same thing for that one. Okay, there's my EPS. Right, so coordinate-wise, th those are my coordinates. Okay, when EBIT is this, that was the EPS, the earnings per share. Okay, you can obviously round these figures off. Nearest cent would be best because this is rands and cents. And there you go. There's the first one. Okay, there's plan A. Right, let's do plan B. Where's my plan B? There's my plan B. Copy paste. Okay, again, I'm going to be using this. Using three different EBITs. Those are my three different EBITs. Right, I'm going to less interest, get EBT, less taxes, get net profit off the tax, then work out EPS. Right, so in this scenario, for B... What is my interest going to be? Well, I'm going to raise 2 million and I'm going to sell bonds at 10% interest. So my interest will be 2 million times 10%. 200,000. Okay, work out the EBIT, so that minus the interest. Taxes is 50% of this. Net, off, net pro operating profit after tax. There we go. Right, so now you've got the net profit after uh, tax, okay? And you're going to use the same formula again, okay, to work out EPS. But with if I issue bonds, I'm not going to change the current shares that I've issued. So I've only got 100,000 shares. Okay, this is based on 140,000 shares. And this is based on 100,000 shares. Okay, so this divided by 100,000 shares. Okay, it gives me those figures. So now I've got the EPS with those corresponding EBITs. Right, the last one, plan C, 2 million raised, selling pref shares, okay? Again, I'm going to be using three randomly chosen EBITs because that's what they want me to do. I'm going to have to do these workings. And then I'm going to work out the EPS. OK, 
Okay, so I'm going to work out the profit for the year. There's going to be no interest. There's going to be tax. 50% tax. So the EPS, I need to work that out. Based on 100,000 ordinary shares and preference dividends of. Okay, let's work out the preference dividends. Right, how many pre pref shares do I issue? Let's go work that out. Issuing pref shares with an 8% dividend. Okay, it's an 8% dividend and it's a 2 million issue. So 2 million times 8% equals 2 million times 8% is what? Hundred and sixty thousand. All right. So when I work out the EPS, I'm going to open a bracket here for the numerator. It's profit minus the pref div divided by a hundred thousand shares. And the same for that one, and the same for that one. And that's it. Now you've got your figures. Let's go read the question again. Calculate three coordinates for each plan by selecting any three EBIT values and finding their associated EPS values. Okay, so let's summarize because we've done it. Plan A. Plan B. Plan C. Okay, the EBIT and the corresponding EPS. Okay, so plan A, when the EBTI is this, the EPS is that. Plan A, plan A, when the EBIT is this, the EPS is that. When the EBIT is this, the EPS is that. Plan B, when it's this, it's that. When it's this, the EPS is that. There and there. Okay, I'm summarizing. Right, plan C, last one. When the EBIT is this, the EPS is that. When the EBIT is this, the EPS is that. When the EBIT is this, the EPS is that. Okay, and there's my summary. Right, obviously, how many co what colors did I use here? Purple, blue, and purple, blue, and pink. Okay, there we go. There's a summary. I've done it. How many marks was that for? Eight marks. Anything else? Yes. Okay. 3.2. Plot the three financing plans on a set of EBIT EPS axes and indicate which structure you would recommend. Justify your answer. Okay. So I want to show you where this came from in terms of um, theory. Okay. We spoke about this here in terms of firm capital structure. I'm going to actually use this to draw my diagram. Okay, in your, um, what, what set of notes was this? Study support material five notes. You had this. This came from the textbook. 
where you were given a diagram where you had EPS and EBIT with two axes. And we had to discuss, or not discuss, we had to draw. Okay, plot these things on an axis and indicate which structure you would recommend. Okay, so which structure would you recommend after we put on an axis? All right, so obviously I need the axis. Okay. What question number is this? Question 3.2. Okay, I'm going to plot these points on the axis. Uh, let's go back to the diagram. Let's get those labels. Okay, EPS is going to be on this side. EBIT is going to be on that side. Okay, so what EBITs did I choose? Uh, let's go see. 4 million, 8 million, 16 million. All right, so let's put those four there. 4 million, 8 million, 16 million. All right, those are my three EBITs, chosen EBITs. Uh, wrong page, this one. Okay, oh, the points. It's actually this further up. Okay, there are my points. Okay, so my points are there. I don't know if you can see it. I'm running out of space here. It's a bit difficult to fit it all in, but it's fine. Okay, there's the... All right, so plan A. Four million gave me 14.29. Okay, so I'm going to plot these points. 14.29. I need a, uh, I need a purple dot. Okay, 14.29 was for 4 million. 14.29. I'll put the labels just now. Okay, 4 million. Plan B was 19. Okay, I need a blue dot. Four, 19 is a bit more. It's higher up. Okay, that's a blue dot. Okay, and then this one was 18.4, which is a bit lower, and that's a pink dot. Or red dots, I'm gonna use red, okay. Uh, I've got bigger figures, so this needs to go down a bit more. Okay, so let's put that there. Put that there. Let's put that there. Okay, let's label them. Uh, the blue dot was 19. The red dot was 18.4. Actually, very close. They should be a bit closer together. Okay, purple dot, what were you? 14.29. Okay, there's my first dot, there. Eight million now, let's put the eight million in now. Okay, so eight million, eight million there. 28 is the lowest figure. Okay, 28 is gonna be about there. Okay, that was that one. Next one, 39. Thirty-nine. And then red dots, thirty-eight point four. Thirty-eight 
Right, so for that EBIT, I've got that EPS. Okay, and then the last one. 16 million. 16 million, 78, 79, 57. Okay, so again, this is the lowest. Okay, we're going to go a bit further up. Need a bit more space here. Okay, so for 16 million, purple was 57.14. For blue, 79. For red, 78.4. There we go. All we need to do now is draw the lines. What did they say? Uh, plot the three... Financing plans on a set of axes, we've done that. Indicate which structure you would recommend. Okay, we just need to indicate. Right, all I need to do now is just join the dots. Okay, our blue is fine for this one. Okay, I need red for this one. And purple for this one. Okay, which structure would you recommend? Justify your answer. Okay, look at this. EBIT for all of these, which is the highest? The EPS in terms of value, blue. So which was blue? Plan B. Plan B is the best. Okay, so which would I recommend? Plan B is the best because based on the EBITs, comma, plan B always has an EPS which is higher than the other plans. Okay, that makes sense because if you look at plan B, plan B was looking at selling bonds. If you're going to introduce bonds, those bonds is going to increase your owner's equity. Okay, we know that debt raises the return on equity. So you would expect the EPS to increase, and that's what we can see here in the diagram. Eight marks, done. Final question, question four, this was for 21. 4.1, show the effect on equity accounts. Okay, this is for dividends. Let's read the question. The board of Lofeld Transport Company is ex uh, exploring ways to expand the number of issued shares in an effort to reduce the market price per share to a level that the firm considers more appealing to investors. Okay, the options under consideration, 20% share dividend, or alternatively, a 544 share split. At the, t at the present time, the firm's equity account and other per share information are as follows. Okay, so there you go. Pref shares, ordinary shares. Share premium, retained earnings, total shareholder equity, price per share, earnings per share, and the dividend per share. Okay. All right, so obviously the first one is looking at a dividend, so giving out a dividend. Then the second one is looking at a share split. And then we need to look at which is the best option. Okay, which option will reduce it. 
quite a few questions here. There might even be some theory, but we'll look at it. All right, first things first is obviously to take what you know and to create an answer. Okay, you need to be able to structure your answers correctly. That's the hardest part. Okay, so question 4.1.1. Show the effect on the equity accounts and per share data of a 20% share dividend. Okay, so we need to look at what is a 20% share dividend going to do to this. Well, currently, um, let's actually put all of these down so we've got them. Uh, I just want to shrink this a bit so I can insert it quite easily. Okay. Great, there we go. Okay, so that's the information that was given in the question. Let's go back. 4.1.1, show the effects on the equity accounts and the per share data of a 20% share dividend. Okay, so 20% share dividend. made a typo here it's price per share okay so let's look at the retained earnings the retained earnings 700,000 okay this is a 20% share dividend okay so if it's a share dividend that means we're going to be issuing the shares uh, we need to just confirm that let's just double check um, if I go to the textbook, okay, all of this is in chapter 14, okay, dividend policy. Okay, if you've looked at your notes, we could probably go check the notes as well, but I'm just checking the textbook, it's easier. Um, I just want to double check this whole idea of this 20%. This 20% is a 20% of profit or 20% of shares. That's what I want to confirm. Okay, you've got a regular dividend pay payout, you've got an extra dividend, low extra dividend. Okay, there, share dividends. It's on page 564. Page 564, a share dividend. Is a dividend in the form of shares. That's what it is. Okay, so that's what I wanted to confirm. Okay, so now that we've confirmed that, we can work it out. Okay, 20% shares as a share dividend. Okay, so how many shares have I issued? 100,000 shares times 20%. Twenty thousand shares as a dividend. 
that's what's going to happen. Okay, when you issue a share dividend, a share dividend is basically providing shareholders with more shares rather than cash. So in a share dividend, um, the investors are simply going to receive the additional shares in the proportion that they already own, basically. So you're not going to be giving them cash or profit, right? You're not going to be distributing anything. You're just going to be basically allocating more shares to those individuals. So the number of outstanding shares are obviously going to increase, and then the share price is going to decrease. Right, so we know we're going to be issuing total shares after the share dividend equals 120,000 shares. Okay, what did they want? Show the effect on the equity accounts, okay? And per share data of a 20% share dividend. Right, so if I'm issuing more shares, those shares are going to increase. Currently, my total shareholder equity is 170,000, okay? If I'm going to be issuing more shares, I'm going to have to credit another account. So I would debit something like retained earnings, okay, or the share, uh, not the share premium, the retained earnings, and credit ordinary share capital. Okay, we're looking at the effect on those accounts. All right, so those shares are going to decrease in value. They're still going to be, uh, in terms of value, one rand shares, but the price is going to diminish because you have more shares available. All right, so if you look at this, currently the equity is 1.7 million, okay? You've got retained earnings and you've got a share premium. Right, that makes up the 1.7, uh, okay, if you add up those three amounts, if you have a look at that. Right, that's 1 million, that's 1.7, that's the total equity. Right, the price per share is 30 Rand, the earnings per share and the dividends per share. Right, so if I'm going to be issuing more shares, all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be reducing the price. That's all. Okay, so 20,000 additional shares. will be issued. Okay, so the equity remains the same, but the number of shares will increase. Okay, so before, the number of shares were, okay, let's work it out. 1.7 million divided by the price equals this divided by that. Okay. I've got that number of shares. Okay, then I'm going to add more to it. Plus add 20,000. Okay. Okay, so the new share price is 1.7 million divided by that figure, which is now that figure. Okay, so they said, uh, show the effect on the equity accounts and the pro rata uh, per share data. Okay, so per share data is going to go up. The earnings per share is also going to change. All right, so we need to record that. Okay, so new, uh, or let's, let's first work out the uh, earnings per share. Earnings per share, here we had how many shares? There, we had that number of shares. So retained earnings divided by that. 
uh, see these figures don't tie up with what we have uh, which is fine we don't have a profit figure here we've only got retained earnings yeah so it wouldn't be right to use retained earnings um, in terms of earnings per share because that would have been how much they've generated so EPS and DPS I would expect that to decrease okay so the effect of the changes I'm gonna copy this and paste this here okay we need to delete the highlights Okay, so here, show the effect. The effect is going to be ordinary shares will increase by 20,000 shares from the share dividend. Okay, these are the effects. That's what they want you to do in this question. Okay. Share premium, no effect, no effect. Total shareholder equity, no effect. The price per share, this will decrease, will decrease to 22 and 17, if you round it off. Earnings per share, because there are more shares now, you would expect this to decrease, will decrease. will decrease okay we wouldn't we can't work out how much it will decrease by because we don't know what the dividend policy is and we don't know how much their profit was so we wouldn't be able to calculate the decrease okay i was trying to work it out earlier but i couldn't because we don't have that information okay that was for four marks okay it's four marks decrease 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 Four point one point two. Show the effect on the equity account. Same thing. Equity accounts and the per share data for a five four four share split. Okay, with share splits, a five four four share split. Okay, if you want to revise, you can go look at page 565. It's just on the next page. Um, just to recap a little bit of theory here. At the bottom of the page, share split. A method commonly used to lower the market price of a firm's share by increasing the number of shares belonging to each shareholder. Okay, with the share splits, all you're going to be doing is you're going to be changing the ordinary shares. That's all, the number of ordinary shares and the par value. The par value is going to change. Everything else will remain the same. Okay, so uh, I can already put in... Okay, well, let's first do the share split first. I think that'll be easier. Okay, so how many shares did we have? Copy-paste this. Okay, so a 5 for 4 share split. 100,000 shares times 5 divided by 4 equals 125,000. Okay, a 5 for 4 split. So 5 shares for 4. Let's just read that again. 5 for 4 share split. 5 for four share splits. Uh, okay, so if it's a five for four share splits, you're gonna give them five for four share splits. Okay, so, so if it's two for one, I'm gonna give two for one. If it's five for four, I'm gonna give them 125,000 shares to be given to split the equity. That's basically what's happening. Okay, so if we're gonna be doing that, the share price is gonna decrease drastically because currently the price per share, we had that earlier, uh, here, the number of shares, 100,000 
shares. That's 125,000 shares given to the split. Um, okay, so if I'm looking at the price per share, the price per share is 30. What is it going to be now? Well, the total equity will stay the same. 1.7 million divided by uh, brackets 100,000 plus 125,000. Let's see what that is. 1.7 divided by 125,000. I'm missing a zero here. 125 will be 225. Okay. Uh, here's the zero there. Okay, it's 125,000. It's five for four splits. Okay, it gives you that price per share. Right, so let's summarize. Let's take this. Okay, uh, I should actually put this a bit higher because there'll be no effect on the prep shares, obviously. Prep shares won't be affected here. Okay, that's better. All right, so preference shares, no effect. Ordinary shares will increase by 125,000 shares from the share splits. Okay, share premium, no effect, no effect, no effect. Price per share will decrease to 7 Rand 55 or 56 if you round it off. Uh, and we would expect that to decrease as well. Okay. Next question. 4.1.3. Which option will accomplish Lofal Transport's goal of reducing the current share price while maintaining a stable level of retained earnings? Right, that would definitely be the share splits. Okay, this is just theory. Question 4.1.3. The share splits will achieve the best reduction in price. Okay, obviously based on what we've just read or what we've just seen. Which option will accomplish uh, three marks? That's a lot. Um, you might want to add more theory if you can. Um, I'm going to reference that page again for you. 565. Five. Share splits. Please look at the textbook theory and you can maybe share a bit more information there, depending on how much of that you can remember or recall in the actual exam. Okay, 4.1.4. What legal constraints might encourage the firm to choose a share split over a share dividend? Okay, this is theory. Uh, these are legal requirements that we covered in the textbook. I'm just going to give you the page reference for this. Okay, legal requirements and constraints are provided on page 560. Uh, let's just see if there's anything else that I can give you as a reference. Uh, payout policy, dividends, share repurchases. Yeah, that's the best one I would give you. I would give you considerations from page. So see page 560 to 561. In the new textbook. Uh, you could also perhaps look at... The company's viewpoint, which is on page 565.
that you, that's something that uh, that you could also make use of in your answer. It's only three marks. It's not that many points. I, I would suggest maybe two, three, or four points would be adequate for that particular question. Right, four point two. Uh, the Stang Stanger Steel Company has earnings available for ordinary shareholders of two million, and has five hundred thousand issued ordinary shares at sixty rand per share. The firm is contemplating the payment of a two rand per share cash dividend. Required. Calculate the company's current EPS and price earnings ratio. Okay, so these are ratio questions. Current EPS and price earnings. Okay, price earnings. We need two equations. We've looked at the one before. Where is it? Uh, let me just go up there. Okay, those are the two equations you're going to need for 4.2. 4.2.1 actually. Okay, calculate the company's current earnings per share and the price earnings ratio. Fine, four marks. Right, let's look for the information that we need. Uh, let's just shrink this so you can see it. So nice, these are nice, short, easy questions to complete. Okay, there we go. Okay, EPS equals profit for the year. What is it? Earnings available, 2 million. Okay, has issued 500,000 ordinary shares at 6 rand per share, contemplating a cash dividend of 2 rand. Okay. Number of ordinary shares issued, 500,000. Current EPS as it stands, 4 Rand per share. Right, there's the first working. Okay, then we need the price earnings ratio. We need the market price per ordinary share. Do I have that? Yes, I do. Do I have the EPS? Yes, I do. So the price earnings... The market price was 60 Rand divided by earnings per share of 4, which gives a 15 PE. Let's double check that, my maths. Yeah, 15 is right. Okay, it gives a 15 PE. I'm just using formulas. Okay, so we've done that. Current EPS, current earnings per share, that's fine. Okay, 4.2.2. If the company can repurchase shares at 62 Rand per, it's probably share here, they're probably miss, missing that word. How many shares can be purchased in lieu of making the proposed cash dividend payment? Okay, so the company can repurchase shares, repurchase, they want to buy shares. How many shares can be purchased in, make, in lieu of making the proposed cash dividend payment? Okay, so... They want to know in terms of how much they've made as a cash dividend, two rand per share. Okay, so cash dividend is two rand per share. How many shares are there? Uh, 500,000. So 500,000 shares times two rand per share as a dividend equals. times two, ah, times two, not 20%, times two is a million. Okay, so the company has earnings available for ordinary shareholders of two million, okay, uh, has 500,000 issued ordinary shares at 60 Rand a share. Okay, the firm is contemplating the payment of a two rand per share cash dividend. That's what they're thinking about. Right, the question here said, if the company can repurchase shares at two rand per share, uh, 62 rand per share, how many shares can be purchased? Okay, so repurchase at 62 rand per share.
Okay, so repurchase of 62 Rand per share. How many shares is there? If the company can repurchase shares at 62 Rand per share, how many shares can be purchased in lieu of making the proposed cash dividend payment? Okay, so the cash dividend payment is 500,000 shares at 2 Rand per share as a dividend. So 1 million. In dividends divided by 62 Rand per share what does that equal a million divided by 62 16,129 shares okay so if the company can repurchase shares at 62 Rand per share how many shares can be purchased in lieu of making the proposed cash dividend payment okay so if it's a cash dividend payment it's two rand per share which is a million rand okay if i can repurchase share 62 those are the number of shares and that's the last question yes